technology moves forward at such a crazy fast pace that most of the time we don't even have time to stop and think about what we're sacrificing in the name of progress. Our guest today wrote about three great features that companies killed and what we can learn from their loss. Welcome Jason Heiner from Tech Republic. Hey, Megan. Pleased to be here, well, as thanks, ever. <laughs> thanks for coming on. So first, let's talk about the physical keyboard on the smartphone. Uh, when it, it was there until the iPhone, and then it yeah. was, then it disappeared. Why, why did they give it up? Why did Apple uh, decide not to put a physical keyboard on the iPhone? Yeah, so, you know, the iPhone was this, especially the first iPhone, was this amazing device that... Uh, gave you um, the the usability that uh, really none of these devices before could do. It, that was the one problem it was trying to solve, was that these devices, BlackBerry and Windows Mobile primarily, um, were uh, were great for power users, but they were very, very difficult to learn how to use. You had to dig through menus and all of this. And the way that they figured out um, how to do this was to get rid of the keyboard, give you this big one piece of glass that had multi-touch gestures, right? Swipes, pinches, um, all of this kind of thing. And it was so easy. I remember the very first one, I really wasn't quite sure what to think about this thing. I was testing it for about the first week and I was taking some pictures on it and I would show I had a two-year-old at the time. And I, um, I watched her, I set the phone down and I watched her pick it up, swipe to unlock, tap the the phone the photos app and then start swiping through pictures and i went whoa like if my 2 year old can figure out how to use this then even the ceos are going to be able to learn how to use it right so uh, cuz that was the biggest problem executives had all these phones and most of them had no idea how to make a phone call or barely even you know reply to an email um, so you know the iphone solved that but in order to do that it needed that in order to do that sort of um, touch kind of thing that was big enough for your finger to to act as the primary, um, you know, pointer and um, gesture mechanism, it ha it needed more glass. It needed a bigger screen. And in doing that, it lost the thumb keyboard, which so many people um, that loved BlackBerry and that had, uh, you know, become so proficient on them um, decried, right? And even to this day, I think people who used to use Blackberries and Palm Prees and, or sorry, the Palm Trios, um, uh, you know, will tell you uh, that they don't type uh, e as many emails or as long of emails as they do, you know, even back then with the virtual keyboards have gotten a lot better, but it was a big sacrifice, but the trade-off ideally, you know, or, you know, ultimately was, was worth it. It gave us a lot more than it took away, um, with that ability to sort of write longer emails and write more emails. Right. I mean, I, I did not, I haven't always used an iPhone. Uh, and yeah. that was why for a long time, I was like, I just need, I need a keyboard. I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of typing. I can't, I don't yeah. want the on-screen keyboard. It's what kept me away for a long time. And it's like so many th those things with Apple, they're, they're just like, you'll come around, you'll come around. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So it's something that we don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's something I don't miss. Uh, I, I didn't know that it really people were sending fewer emails, but maybe, um, but I guess, yeah, maybe that's the, because of the keyboard or because of something else. We're just writing less and we have more emojis maybe to communicate. <laughs> emoji, the emoji trade off. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, do you think it's true? I mean, do you write as long emails as you used to when you had that that physical keyboard, if you really, if you really think about it? I don't, I don't write as, but I, I always thought that was just time, but I guess it, it really, sure. it, it's, you know, who knows, it's, it's probably both. So, so yeah. uh, offline messages in Gmail was was another one that, that uh, we've lost. I mean, not offline in Gmail, but just yeah. the, the idea that email isn't something that you just use when you're connected to the web. I mean, that was something uh, that existed in the past. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so in Gmail, Gmail was this amazing thing that when it came out, it was like it was in beta for the longest time, right? And two, April 2004 it was launched. And the only way you could get in was through uh, if you knew somebody that had an invite. So the most popular person in your whole network was always the person who had, you know, the Gmail invites uh, if you needed one. Um, but the reason was it did a number of things better. Uh, one, it was faster, you know, loading up uh, email clients used to be so slow, whether it was Mozilla Thunderbird or Outlook Express or Microsoft Outlook. Um, it used to take forever for these things to load, right? Uh, spam was becoming a big problem um, at the time. And then also uh, storage. Gmail gave you this one gig, what was then, back then, one gigabyte of storage, which was about, you know, 
roughly 500 times what most of the other webmail clients were offering. So you didn't have to worry about deleting messages all the time and your box getting full and not being able to accept more emails. Those were big deals. All of those things were a big deal, but the only way they could do it was by making this an, a, a web-based email program. And by doing that, it kind of always had to be connected. Um, it, it did always have to be connected. Whereas things like, at the time, laptops were really taking off at the same time. And one of the things you could do if you're a business traveler, for example, and you had a laptop, and you know you you would open up your email when you still still had a connection. It would download all of your messages. You would get on a plane, for example, or you'd go somewhere that didn't have connectivity, and you could all open up your emails. You could type responses. You could even start new emails, even if you weren't connected. And then when you reconnected to the network, all those things got sent automatically, right? It just would automatically um, sync and send all those messages. Well, Gmail kind of killed that. And so all of a sudden, you're on a plane, you couldn't really, you know, you might be able to look at your emails if that page was still open in a web browser, but when you closed it, but you couldn't op you couldn't send emails, you couldn't, um, you know, start new messages and that kind of thing. You could open up a text pad or something and type them in there and then copy and paste when you, you got online again. But Gmail really was... Google was building Gmail for a world that was always connected, where there was going to be, you know, Wi-Fi on planes and Wi-Fi, you know, public Wi-Fi in in public places, um, and uh, and really good public Wi-Fi um, everywhere. We're still not quite there, but we're a lot closer than we were ten years ago, eleven years ago, when when Google um, started this. Uh, but that was a big trade-off, and it has been a big trade-off over the past decade for those who are using, you know, Gmail or Google apps in place of. Microsoft Outlook um, and Exchange, for example. Right. So in this case, it's like it's not them saying you'll come around. It's like saying like we know the future, and the future yeah. is you'll always be online, and you'll never, even on airplanes, you won't ever have to worry about not being online. This won't be an issue. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, but it wasn't like I said, big trade off, and that and that's what kind of this the whole theme of this uh, this article was that you know pr m making great products is about those trade-offs and being purposeful and you can't do everything. And sometimes you have to get rid of things that you really like and are really important. And in some ways, maybe part of your, the secret sauce of a product. Um, but in order to move forward, sometimes you have to make tough choices. And, and that's what great products do.